leaders of the world. Welcome to Spread Love and Organizations, a podcast for purpose-driven healthcare leaders striving to make life better around the world by leading their teams with genuine care, servant leadership, and love. I'm Naji, your host for this special episode with Dr. Lin Le, Medical Doctor of Inpatient Medicine at Newton Wellesley Hospital, Massachusetts. Dr. Le focuses on operations, strategic, and business planning for the hospitalist division through partnerships with clinical services at Newton uh, Wellesley Hospital and hospitals within the Mass General Brigham Health System. Most recently, um, Eileen led COVID-19 physician redeployment efforts for the Division of Hospital Medicine, as well as, as, well as other key COVID-19 inpatient surge operations. She oversees strategy, budget, operations, recruitment, staffing, as well as professional development for the medical staff of this unit. In addition, Dr. Day is the co-founder of the Surgical Preparation and Navigation Clinic, a perioperative clinic designed to risk stratify and optimize patients undergoing elective surgeries. Dr. Day continues her clinical practice uh, as a physician while also being an assistant clinical professor at Tufts Medical School. Uh, Lean received her internal medicine residency training at Boston Medical Center she attended Dartmouth and Brown Medical Schools and is currently a student at MIT Sloan Executive MBA program. He was born in Vietnam and immigrated to the US at the age of 13. Uh, and I'm just super excited to have you with me uh, today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to, to, to chat. Uh, Lin, I'm eager to hear your personal uh, story. What's behind the amazing leader and the healthcare giver and provider you are uh, today? Um, I think my story um, has to start uh, with Vietnam, where I was born. And I, I was reflecting back, uh, really, in preparation for our conversation. And the first question that came to mind was, where did I start? think about healthcare and where did I start developing this passion for improving life uh, of other people and it really was um, as early as second grade I think because that's my earliest memory of doing something for others um, and I remember just staying up really late um, falling asleep on the floor um, writing essays about care and health care. Um, and as I reflect back, I'm honestly astounded by my own sort of driven um, tendencies at the young age. And then, you know, that was my first inclination of, okay, I there's something within me that drives me to help others. And then it continued to the Philippines um, be, my family moved from Vietnam to the Philippines as refugees in 1990, and we were there for about six months um, as the, the program tried to relocate us to the U.S., and so we went to school there, and I volunteered as a student nurse assistant um, and went there and basically worked in the clinic every single day. That was in, that I, I was 12 at that time. Um, so I don't know the exact time point, but there's always been this drive in me that want to help others. Um, and then we, we moved to the uh, to Maine, uh, Portland, Maine. And I've been um, in the Northeast uh, really for the since then, since um, we moved here in 1991. And this drive of being in healthcare, helping others. Um, improving life uh, with a focus in healthcare really it, it just a part of me um, I think I venture a little bit in college to think of other professions um, and as I went as far as going to a teaching profession which is in many ways uh, still what I do now because I in my work um, I work with a lot of trainees uh, uh, you know as, as a physician so I guess that's a long uh, journey of where it all start. Um, I think it's just a, it's just a, bar, a part of who I am, a part of me. That's that, that's amazing uh, and so powerful, right? You, you said second grade. You already had this drive in you, you know, to improve 
people's lives. This is this is awesome. How how would you define then today your purpose? Like, do you, do you have a definition? Like one sentence. What is your personal why? Um, you just said it. Just to improve the lives of others. And um, I thought a lot about that question, Najid, when I was thinking of going back to school, going to MIT, the program that I'm in now. Um, it, it, I went through a lot of soul searching and reflecting and say, why do I have this, this, this drive? And, and the answer for me at that time was because I, I still I need the skills so I can do a better job in, in improving the lives of others. Um, and it's not just lives in healthcare um, or lives of patients. Um, that's, it's, it's improving patients lives, but also the lives of the people working in the hospital, um, of the physicians, of the nurses, of the transport team members. Um, and so I think um, it boils down to something rather simple, which is my why is just to improve the lives of others. I love it. Uh, and I will get back to it because it's it's really the, the core you know, of, of this initiative of saying, spreading love, talking about internal and external. Before that, I wanted to, with your purpose and your passion, how do you transmit this to your team, right? Like it seems obvious in healthcare that we all strive to make life better for people, but sometimes the day-to-day -day job, as you said, gets in the way and we're just so focused operationally that we forget what is our real purpose. D did you face this? Did you have stories on this and how you keep your yourself and most importantly how you lead your team to keep this focus on patients and improving their lives yeah i think it's still something that i'm continually working on i think for me the steps are first i need to make sure that what i what i do my own action represent uh, truly my why so i start with me um and then when I lead my team, um, team members, um, I spend a lot of time um, thinking or checking in with them and making sure that I can help them or, or promote them or spread their wings so that they, they also develop their why and, and go towards their purpose. Um, and I, I love uh, getting the team members together um, and I actually learned this from uh, a person who taught me um, this program called Advisory Board. Uh, his name is Matt Corner. And um, he, uh, I went through this program a few years ago, um, basically a, a fellowship and leadership training. And that was the time when I, he really helped me pause and reflect on my why. And, and really, um, there's this phrase that he used and say, you know, make sure you pause and get on the balcony and look down and look at yourself and see, are you, um, are you serving your purpose? Are you going towards your, uh, your, your North star? And sometimes you need to step out of your, your own arena, get on the balcony and make sure that you, you, where you're supposed to be. Um, and I, I do that now, not infrequently, and I, again, have Matt to thank for it. Um, so to answer your initial question of how do I do it, I, I start with me. I, I get on the balconies often now um, and to make sure that I have my why clear and then I help my team members um, individually to find their strength, their purpose, but then also I strive to get them all together, uh, whether the project or, or a program, I always have, I spend a lot of time having that vision, that why statement for the team to follow. And then we come back to that quite often. That's what I hope to do. And that's what I'm doing with a lot of initiatives that I start now. And, and it's, it's a much more effective than just, I think, just say, go do it. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Communicating. I'm going back in the beginning of the meeting and yeah, yeah even ending with it right like yeah and you you talked about balcony I, I know we talked about another piece in the house that you are that you strongly believe is super important you know with with the foundations and the basement uh, in, yeah. in a separate chat 
so, and it links to what you said, like how you can improve life for people in your team also mm -hmm. and their environment while you're improving lives of other patients. Can you tell us a little bit more about this leadership belief you had? The, so I guess I would, how would I, I was like oh I, I need to link my balcony to my, my basement now <laughs> <laughs> so i get on the balcony to make sure my basement is 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 functioning and aspiring to its purpose uh, is how i link uh, so um in the chat that we had earlier that you're mentioning i really think that an organization is as strong as um the strength of its basement the basement is the the core the foundations of of the the organization and in, and that what i'm i what i mean is it's really the people that do the work um so in a hospital for example we have we talk about this sort of the simile right the the analogy of so in the basement there's a lot of um important essential work of the um, the storage uh, team, the construction team, the transport team, sometimes labs in the basement. There's a lot of um, essential operational teams that are physically located down there, not because they're less important, it's just how it works. But I think hospital systems, um, if we focus the energy, develop those teams and really actually highlight um, those team members, um, I think we will, as a, an organization, do much better. And I think my basement analogy sort of expands to the front line, the uh, employees. So, for example, in, in one of the units that I uh, am the medical director of, it's called the observation unit, we focus a lot of delivering high quality, efficient care. Um, and efficient, but extremely high quality. And, and the basement there uh, in the sense would be the, uh, the physician, the uh, unit coordinator answering the phones and coordinating patient throughput, the physician care assistants who are helping us um, get the patient the, the, the most, um, the high quality, uh, highly personal uh, care. Those are team members that are sort of the foundational uh, um, sort of the foundations of of an institution organization and when you elevate and inspire and actually let them lead um we all do better you know obviously physicians oh i i'm a physician i'm a physician leader and and i'm leading and i love leading uh but i think finding ways to allow those members to lead um and, and collectively lead uh, the efforts, I think will be much better off. Um, and because everyone everyone have the workflow that they, the expert at, um, the transport person knows much better than me and can lead the team on how to, let's say, to get the patient po from point A to point B in our effort at um, developing or improving throughput. Um, so that's, that's what I meant when I said lead, lead, lead the basement. Yeah, linking balcony to basement. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this sentence. Uh, and when when you're saying you know empowering people, right? Like empowering them and everyone having a say. And as you said, it's uh, it's it's proven many and many times, right? Like the best innovations comes from people who are in the action, right? Who are doing the the job. Uh, how, how do you maintain this? H have you been successful, or do you have? even failures, I'm sure like we all have ups and downs uh, to, to make sure that people are speaking up and they are coming to the physician lead and telling them, well, I, I think it's, we can do better here. Do you have yeah. any example on how you keep this culture of, of speaking up and empowerment? Yeah, um, I think using the, the observation unit, I, I guess the other, um, so there's, I like to call them my startups. <laughs> Uh, you know, in, in the hospital, it, it's, it's a new initiative within a, a larger corporate entrepreneurship is, is how I, I want to use w one of the examples. So um, as far as uh, empowering team members, um, you know, successes would be uh, the story of the observation unit where I 
you know, early on, we, we actually um, had many team meetings and in the hospital, um, you, pro you know this um, because you're a physician yourself. Typically we have team meetings of, you know, physician teams and we have nurse teams and we have other team members, but the nurse director that worked with me um, is really wonderful and have similar vision of how we build a team. A team um, in the hospital really should comprise of um, the transport person, the PCA, the housekeeper. I would love that person to be in there, the nurse and the doctor because those are the team members that really linked arms to, to move a patient from point A to point B. And so when you have a team meeting, those members needs to be there. Um, a care coordination, a case manager need to be in there as well. And one of the things we did early on, which is this unit was brand new, did not exist at my hospital. We set that culture very early on. Um, we uh, had, whole team meetings and we would spend some time doing operations um strategy you know uh, collaboration uh, more business type meetings but we also spend some of the time um, on educational sessions so we would teach a topic um i remember uh one was uh, kidney stones um and it was really wonderful one of my favorite favorite memories and the doctor would ask um sort of doctor questions and the nurses would ask questions that honestly, frankly, I didn't think about and, and didn't even know to ask, but the nurse was asking questions that was very pertinent to my work that I didn't think about, uh, that the nurse get asked all the time by the patient. Um, and then the PCA who had a very different training asked questions that was pertinent to her work. And so in aggregate, um, it was a really powerful sort of experience of how how building a team, um, a true team in a clinical setting um, really lead to better sort of obviously teamwork, but translate to much better patient experience and outcome. So that's, I would be, that would be an example of um, uh, success, uh, I guess for me, a failure um, in the same vein is maintaining is really difficult. Um, <clears throat> And that's one difficulty, but the other difficulty is finding time um, and to restate your purpose. And as leaders, you, you, no matter how hard you try, you get into a firefighting mode. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you just keep getting on new projects and new projects and things that, uh, that you had started with a certain plan, um, sort of because of other competing attentions or projects or initiatives, you lose track of your why. And, and so we actually, for, for this team, for example, we paused the last few months to be honest because of the whole COVID surge and people were all over um, and trying to sort of stay afloat. Um, but we just met yesterday. This is the, the balcony moments, right? Um, this is when I was like, you know what? I, I got to step back and let's get on the balcony, like Matt would say, uh, mm -hmm. and see where I am with each of the things that I'm doing. And am I going towards my initial whys? And am I still there? Do I need to regather the teams and, and keep track of making sure, you know, that's, that's the job of a leader. You, you need to find your own checkpoints and then you need to you know get other people back to the path that you initially set to be to be on sometimes it's more difficult than others but um but that's the leader's job so, so powerful you know when when you talked about the positive story i think we can learn so much of it not only in hospital settings and old settings i can tell you also in the corporate world is the same like how, how how to break those barrier of hierarchy, of re really having a co-work with team members that can bring way more insights to improve the outcome, as you said, right? And, and it's, it's key what, what you've been doing and we can learn from it. Um, and on the, you know, on, on this side that where you talked about the pandemic, we're kind of feeling we're out of it. I think you're having, having the courage as a leader to put yourself on the balcony from time to time. It's really courage many leaders won't even do right and introspect and reflect back on themselves first and how to lead their team so kudos to you on doing that um, 
I, I, I don't want to go and talk a lot about the pandemic, but I want to look at it more from, you know, a, a lens of a leader and what you've learned. It was obviously super hard for you. You talked about being a firefighter. I, I can't imagine how you led through complete firefighting for a year and a half, which is crazy. Usually it's kind of a couple of weeks or months. A any major learning you're keeping to keep on like making things better and better moving forward uh, for your teams? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, um, of course, I never would ever wish for anything even remotely similar to this to, to happen again. Uh, but um, I, there was so many, I'm getting goosebumps and emotional just actually thinking about it. There were so many powerful moments um, that I experienced um, personally during the pandemic. And, and there were obviously very dark moments, but those lighter moments um, really kept me going. And I knew early on that we would be able to make it through because of the human spirit that I that I experienced. Um, and so I, as you know, I um, was really um, in charge of organizing, uh, getting enough physicians and, and getting physician volunteers to work in the hospital um, during the first and actually also the second surge of the pandemic. And the emails and the phone calls I got from physicians and retired physicians who just said, you know, count me in um, and I will help you or let, what can I do? Can I type for, you know, you? Can I, you know, come show up and, and bring your team coffee? Um, you know, people were just rolling up the sleeve, but also in those heroic um moments of people of volunteering themselves there was also tremendous uh inspiring vulnerab vulnerabilities that people showed to me um there was a lot of fear and, and anxiety and but people were actually really open about it and and both um and that actually made it really powerful that that people were say I'm scared but this is something that we can do together. So let's do it together. Um, and um, those were really powerful moments. And, and, I, and with nurses too, and that was the other really wonderful, actually not just nurses, nurses and respiratory therapists and um, the physician assistants and the housekeeper of the hospital. There was so many, it's countless moments um, of my own personal recollection of, of how it impacted me. And I remember one of the nurses, um, she and I, it was a long shift and we had just surged into um, a, a second ICU, an ICU that we started from scratch to, to accommodate um, another successful story at Newton Wellesley Hospital for sure, um, to the, the volume. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, in March and April, we knew nothing about the virus, right? Or how we how we need to treat the patient and what drugs we should use. And I remember the two of us had a moment where we were both scared. Um, you know, we were gowned up and I could see uh, worries in the nurse's eyes and she probably sensed it in mine too. And we just kind of together said, let's go in the room together. And we went in the room together. Neither of us actually had anything to do. <laughs> but that one moment, and I'm getting teary because I know exactly, I remember the, the, the her face and, and we just said, let's go in together. And we did. And it was, so those were moments that I, that I will carry on, um, that will always float me, so to speak, uh, for the rest of my professional life. Um, but um, I, I guess uh, for me, learning lessons, um, again, uh, we, our division, our hospital, I think the, the one thing we did really well was we empower people. And when you s said, you know, these are all the different needs, you know, someone leave, 
in a crisis, there is always people with skills. And if you empower them, they actually would do a really good job leading the team. Um, and, and you also not just say you lead, but you actually truly felt um, or you really need to allow them and trust them and um, elevate them so they can successfully lead. There were so many stories like that in, in the 15 months. And out of the pandemic, we have so many new leaders because of it. And it's, um, at least in my division, there was someone that literally built the way that we um, do care coronation plan. So back in, before pandemic, as an example, we would get into this room and we all like nurses and doctors and like, I don't know, 10, 15 people um, would discuss plan for all the patients on a certain floor. Obviously, because the social distancing and mask needs and all of that stuff, we need to disperse. But we had no other way. That was this was even before Zoom became the thing. And and but he independently built an a, a platform so we could instantaneously and we use different we use Zoom and Skype and all. But he built it from scratch, and he had no formal title or whatever. That was just his expertise, and we were just like we need to do this, go for it. And here, what, are, what do you need? Here are what you, you know, here are ideas, go for it and promote him. We have physician assistants who, who basically just ran a, a bunch of coronation for testing in the beginning. And she never did anything like that before, but it was about trusting your colleagues, your employees, capabilities and expertise and and elevate them and allow them room and space and say yes you can do it yes i trust you yes i will be behind you and again i can name 10 other stories that came out of the covid pandemic so that's the biggest lesson for me um it's it's sort of uh, relates to my own personal principle of leading from the basement uh but the covid uh, and the surge and uh, and um, really just brought that home and confirm affirm that belief of mine. So, wow, like humbling and so sobering. I, I yeah, I'm speechless. I don't know how to do a transition now to the next section. But yeah, thank <laughs> you. You know, thank you for sharing this. And obviously, we can't thank enough the frontliners during those times. It was tough times and. I always feel, you know, also as as a physician being in healthcare, um, yeah, we we said we we heard a lot of things, but hopefully we will keep the heroic work that you guys have done throughout the pandemic. And as we're going back to normal, we don't forget about this, right? And it's well, it's not just you know sentences that were said. So yeah, th thanks again for for sharing this. Um, the next section, I want to give you one word and I would love to have your reaction to it. So first thought that would come after I say the word. Sounds good? You might. Uh, yes. But before we move on to that next section, can I just say one thing about sure. uh, just to, to convey what I think uh, my role in the pandemic, um, the word hero uh, does not apply to me in the pandemic um, because I I was not, it was not heroic. It was, it's, it, I was doing my job. Um, I, my job as a doctor is to take care of patients. And was I scared at times? Was I living at a hotel at times? Yeah, all of those things. Um, but it was doing my job. So I guess if you go to do your job, I'm not sure. I would, that's why I, I'm, there were many, many other people who are heroes and I would call them hero in a heartbeat and uh, just me, not, not me. Um, I, I, uh, I, I want to be a doctor because we talk about improving lives of others. And I, I was just doing my best to carry out my duties as a physician. So we can move on, but just want to make sure <laughs> I, I don't get it. I don't get to put in the same sentence as a hero. <laughs> no, you're, you're such like, I know how humble, you are, Dean, and this is this is part of your amazing leadership style. Uh, but yeah, allow me to say you you are a hero. I think this is how the world would see you. <laughs> uh, 
so the first word I would give you is uh, authenticity. Uh, I hope that I come across as being authentic. Um, I spend a lot of time, I think, internalizing and reflecting. And honestly, part of this conversation, Najid, we talk about this as well, is for me to be able to tell my stories publicly more. Um, I, I, so that I can convey my, I guess conveying authenticity is a little bit not authentic, but um, I, I want to be viewed as someone who's authentic, true to self, um, transparent. Um, it is, it is a, um, a trait, a, um, for me, it's almost like a moral value that I really respect. Um, it's, it's a must have, and it's something that I high hold myself sort of accountable for and to that standard. Um, but like, but I hope that I come across as uh, authentic because it is a, a trait that I look for in a human being. You, you definitely do. Uh, what about the word leadership? We talked a lot about it. I'd love to have your one word definition and reaction to it. Uh, one word definition, leadership would be serving because that's what you know that's what you do you serve um maybe we should do that equation leader should equal serving <laughs> uh, and that's that's what um uh, and i'm i'm a believer in servant leadership leading from behind um doing things to make lives better for the leaders that you lead um, I think I would love and I strive for leading without sort of the, vi the, the picture of me carrying the flag, you know, um, I'd love to lead in, in a way that is not sort of like, I, I, I inspire, motivate and get people to be their true self and, and, and advance without sort of patting my chest or carrying the flag down the down the hallway. Um, and and um, again, it's, it's about leading from behind, leading the basement team, leading the foundational front line, the people that actually do the work. Um, and then I think leading people to find their true selves and their, their, their capabilities. That's my favorite thing actually. Um, to, to have one-on-one -on -one conversation with the various colleagues and members and say, what are, what do you like to do? What do you aspire to do? And help them find that that joy and and bring them to the next step. Um, I would say that um, I, I many years ago, I started a, a program at Newton Wellesley for my division called the um, Professional Development Program. It's about mentorship and sponsoring. Um, and I did that with new physicians that hired into a division um, I, my favorite thing to do now is sort of working with some of the um, physician assistants, um, but other hospitalists in my program, just just asking them, you know, what do you like, you know, and it's like, this is something you're really good at, and giving them that little nudge to sort of find their, um, their strength and their capabilities, because, again, I truly at my core believe that every single one of the team members have and have uh have the innate you know uh natural ability to do something that transcends the team members beyond me and i think like if they are successful in their right and get promoted be on top of me great yeah. Uh, yeah. and so yeah The last, uh, the last word is spread love in organizations. Well, it's, it is just that though, spread love. I don't know if I need to translate that more. Um, I think it's about linking arms. It's about um, really getting to know each other as 
humans, I think it start there. It, it doesn't start any anywhere more complicated than than just that. Um, I think we we talked about this yesterday. Um, I talked about this with one, a couple, or another physician and a nurse uh, leader. Um, we talked about just trying to get the doctor and the nurses together to eat cookies together. You know, that's how you you need to build human connections. That's spreading love. Um, you know how finding out your, what your dog's name or your cat's name and how many kids you have that's spreading love and it starts there i think if we could do uh, the pandemic unfortunately push some of that boundaries you know physically away from us uh but spreading love is is rather simple it's about really building that that human connection one at a time maybe over a cookie <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> Uh, Dean, any final word of wisdom for the leaders, uh, healthcare providers, the the students, you know, that you uh, that you lead uh, in your organization, and for leaders across the world? I think there for me, it's um, it's about finding time to reflect, um, to get on on the balcony. Um, and to actually uh, be a learner yourself, I think leadership journey um, is a it's a learned uh, it's a it's a student journey, um, which is why I'm I'm doing the the um, executive MBA. I I think leader some people have innate abilities, but leadership leadership skills uh, are taught and uh, foster and developed. And I think leaders, leaders um, need to continue learning. And whether that's by sort of getting feedback from your team members or formal education, but the journey, the, the journey of learning how to be a better leader doesn't stop. Um, and I hope, I think that's something that I'm striving to, um, to be, and I think that that is essential in all in all leaders. I think to, to just have this yearn to learn how to be a better leader. Thank you so much, Lean, again for for being with me today for such an inspiring and emotional uh, conversation we had. But thank you. Oh well, thank you for for the time. It's just always a pleasure to chat with you. I'll see you in class next week. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to Spread Love and Organization podcast. Connect with us on spreadloveio.com. Subscribe to your favorite podcast app. And please spread the word around you to inspire more leaders, amplify this movement our world so desperately needs. Thank you.